Over the past few years, we have explored a wide range of animations and one of the most requested effects by far has been a fluid distortion based slider like this. After spending a good chunk of last week and putting it together, I am excited to finally share it with you. You have probably seen these kind of smooth advanced interactive slider on modern sites. In today's video, I'll walk you through how to build this infinite image slider using 3JS where each slide is a 3D plane geometry that distorts dynamically based on scroll velocity, key presses and touch gestures. We'll dynamically curve the mesh to create smooth responsive visual feedback and it works seamlessly on both desktop and mobile. Creating content like this consistently takes a ton of time and effort, especially with two videos a week. So if you find this helpful, I would really appreciate it if you drop a like on the video and maybe consider subscribing as well. If you want to unlock the source code, you can check out the pro membership, link is in the description. I am confident you won't find this level of content delivered this consistently anywhere else, especially at this price. Alright, let's jump into the code. For the HTML part, we are keeping things minimal, we'll add a simple navbar and footer with some placeholder text, just to give the page a bit of structure and avoid that empty look. But the most important element here is the canvas tag. This is where we'll render our distortion slider using 3JS, so make sure it's included in your HTML. That's really all we need to get started. Now let's go over the styling. We begin by resetting the default spacing and applying consistent box sizing across all elements to maintain layout stability. The body is styled with a clean mono spaced font and a soft neutral background color. Text elements use uppercase styling, subtle letter spacing and font smoothing. The navbar and footer are fixed at the top and bottom of the screen, stretching across full width with padding and spacing to frame the content. Most importantly, the canvas is fixed to cover the full viewport. Again, this is where the entire 3JS slider will be rendered, so it needs to stay behind everything else and take up the full screen. Alright, let's start building our distortion slider. First, we import everything from 3JS. Next, we select the canvas element from our HTML. Then, we set up the WebGL renderer. This is what 3JS uses under the hood to draw everything onto the canvas. We also enable anti-aliasing to smooth out the edges and preserve the drawing buffer in case we want to save or manipulate the canvas later. We set the size of the render to match the browser window and we also adjust the pixel ratio to ensure things look sharp even on high resolution displays. Now it's time to create our scene. This is essentially the container that will hold all the 3D objects we need like our slider, camera and any effects. We also set a background color for the scene to match the aesthetic we want for the slider. In this case, that light neutral grey color. After that, we set up the camera. We are using a perspective camera which simulates the way we perceive depth in real life. We give it a field of view and aspect ratio based on the window size and near and far clipping planes to control what gets rendered. And finally, we move the camera back a bit along the z-axis so it's ready to view the slider from the front. Next, we are going to define some global settings that will control the behavior and feel of our slider. These include sensitivity values for both mouse wheel and touch input, how much momentum is applied when scrolling, how smooth the slider movement feels and how fast the distortion effect fades out after interaction. We also set the maximum amount of distortion we want to apply, how reactive it is to movement and how quickly it eases into place. Once that's done, we define the core layout of our slider. This includes the width and height of each slide, the gap between them and how many total slides we want to create. We also set how many different images we'll be using and then calculate the total width of the entire slider based on the number of slides and gaps. Then we define some variables to help manage the state of the slider like the current and target scroll position, whether the user is actively scrolling and the speed of auto scroll momentum along with the timestamps for animations. We also store values for touch input which we'll need to handle mobile gestures. 
Finally, we define two key variables that control distortion, the current distortion amount and the target value we are using toward. We also keep track of the peak velocity and a small history of recent scroll speeds which we'll use later to make the distortion feel dynamic and reactive. Now let's move on to generating the slides. First, we define a small helper function to correct the image color space. By default, 3GS might render textures in linear space, so we explicitly set it to RGB to ensure accurate vibrant color rendering. Then we move into the create slide function. This is the core piece that sets up each slide in the carousel. We start by generating a plane geometry with a good number of segments, 32 along width and 16 along the height. These subdivisions are essential because will be distorting the mesh later and you need enough vertices to get a smooth fluid curve. Next, we define a fallback color for the material using a predefined list. This gives each slide a distinct placeholder color before the texture loads in, which is helpful for debugging or lazy loading scenarios. We create a mesh from the geometry and material and position it in the scene based on its index, spacing them out horizontally with a consistent gap. Here is an important part. We store the original vertex positions in the mesh's user data. Since we'll be updating the Z positions of these vertices to simulate distortion, we need the untouched originals as a reference. This gives us full control to cow and uncow the mesh on demand. After that, we determine which image to load for this particular slide. We are looping over a limited set of image files to simulate variety. We load the image using 3JS's texture loader. Once it loads, we assign it to the material and reset the base color to white. Then we adjust the mesh scale to maintain the correct image aspect ratio within our slide dimensions. This avoids any stretching or clipping regardless of the image shape. Finally, we add the mesh to the scene and push it into our slides array so we can reference it later during animation and distortion updates. Once the function is ready, we loop through and call it for the total number of slides we defined earlier. This populates the entire slider layout. After generating the slides, we shift all of them to left by half the total width. This is just a centering trick. It ensures that the first slide isn't all the way off screen and keeps the carousel centered in the viewport from the beginning. We also initialize some custom properties inside user data, including each slide's current and target expositions. These will help us smoothly animate slide movement frame by frame using interpolation. So at this point, all of our slides are set up, correctly spaced, image textured, and ready to be animated with distortion. Now let's get into the core of what makes this slider feel so fluid and dynamic, the distortion. We define a function called updateCow, which takes in a mesh, its current world X position, and a distortion factor. The goal here is to take each vertex of the slide and slightly displace it along the Z axis, but we don't just push them randomly. We calculate a smooth curved distortion based on how close each vertex is to the center of the screen. First, we define the distortion center, in this case, the origin, and set a distortion radius, which controls how far the effect spreads across the mesh. We also calculate the maximum amount of curvature based on the current distortion factor which is constantly updated based on scroll or gesture velocity. Then we access the mesh's geometry and pull out both the live vertex positions and the original unmodified vertex array that we stored earlier. This allows us to apply distortion relative to the original shape every frame, ensuring smooth resets and avoiding cumulative mesh damage. Now we loop through every vertex in the mesh. For each one, we extract its X and Y position and compute its position in world space by offsetting it with the slide's horizontal position in the scene. Next, we calculate how far this vertex is from the center of the distortion field. This gives us a distance value that we normalize and invert so vertices closer to the center are affected more. We then use a sine curve raised to a power for a sharper falloff to generate the actual Z offset for that vertex. This gives us a smooth organic curvature rather than a harsh or linear bump. Once all that Z values are updated, we mark the geometry for an update so 3JS knows to re-upload the vertex data to GPU and then we recompute the normals. The last part is optional for basic distortion but it's helpful if you plan to use lighting or want proper shading transitions. So essentially this function dynamically reshapes the mesh into a slight favor bump depending on how fast or recently the user has interacted, creating that buttery smooth distortion effect as the slider moves.
All right, now let's set up the user input controls, starting with keyboard navigation. We add an event listener for the key down event. When the user presses the left arrow key, we move the slider to right by one full slide unit. And when they press right arrow, we shift it to the left by the same amount. At the same time, we increase the target distortion factor. This triggers a visible bump or distortion effect during movement, making it feel more dynamic and alive. Next, we define the scroll input, and this is where it starts getting really interactive. We listen for the fail event and prevent the default browser scroll behavior. We calculate how strong the scroll was by measuring the delta value and use that to increase the distortion factor proportionally. So faster scrolls create more intense distortion. Then we adjust the slider's target position based on the scroll delta and a sensitivity setting. This makes the slides move in response to how far and how fast the user scrolls. We also calculate an auto scroll speed that creates a bit of momentum. So when the user stops scrolling, the slider continues to glide for a moment. This is what gives the slider that really satisfying inertia driven movement. To manage that momentum, we set a timeout that detects when scrolling has stopped. If no scroll event is received for a short period, we mark the flag as false which signals the animation loop to start easing everything back to rest. All of this, from scroll velocity to distortion intensity, is designed to make the interaction feel fluid, tactile and responsive. Now let's make the slider work seamlessly on touch devices. We start by listening for the touch start event. Here, we store the initial touch position and reset any scroll related flags. This gives us reference point to track how far the user drags that finger across the screen. Then in the touch move event, we prevent the default behavior, again just like we did for scrolling, to take full control over the interaction. We calculate the difference between the current touch point and the last one which gives us the swipe direction and strength. Based on that, we move the slider by adjusting the target position just like we did with scroll input, but now using a separate touch sensitivity setting. We also increase the distortion factor based on how fast the user is swiping. This keeps the animation feel consistent between desktop and mobile. Both gesture types result in dynamic mesh cropping. Next, we handle the touch end event. When the user lifts their finger, we calculate the swipe velocity. If it's strong enough, we apply momentum to keep the slider gliding even after the touch ends. We also amplify the distortion briefly based on that velocity, creating a quick ripple effect that decays over time. And then we trigger a short timeout to stop scrolling flag after the momentum fades out. Finally, we add a resize event listener to keep everything responsive. If the browser window size changes, we recalculate the camera's aspect ratio and update the renderer to match the new dimensions. This ensures that the slider remains perfectly scaled and centered no matter the screen size or orientation. Alright, now we are into the animation loop and this is where everything comes to life. We define an animate function and call request animation frame to make it run on every frame. This keeps the loop synced with the browser's refresh rate for smooth, efficient updates. At the start of each frame, we calculate the time difference since the last frame. This delta time helps us keep our movement and velocity calculations frame rate independent so the animation remains consistent across devices. Next, we store the current position before any updates. We'll use this to calculate velocity in a moment. If the user is actively scrolling, either via mouse or touch, we apply the auto scroll speed to target position. Then we decay that momentum over time using a dynamic factor that depends on how fast the scroll was. This is what gives that soft glide after the user lifts their finger or stops scrolling. Once that speed is low enough, we kill the momentum entirely by setting the scroll speed to zero. Then we update the current position by easing it toward the target using a smoothing factor. This interpolation helps create that floaty spring-like effect as the slides follow user input. Now to drive the distortion, we need to track velocity. We calculate the current scroll velocity, push it into a history buffer and compute the average. This gives us a clean smoothed out representation of how fast the slider is moving. We compare the average velocity to the peak velocity to determine whether the slider is deaccelerating. This allows us to dynamically adjust how the distortion decays, making it respond differently during acceleration versus slowdown. We also kept the distortion based on movement. The faster the scroll, 
the higher the distortion but it quickly eases down once the movement stops. Finally, we interpolate the current distortion factor toward its target using another smoothing factor. This makes the distortion ease in and out naturally rather than snapping. Then we loop through all these slides to update their positions. We calculate each slide's base position based on the current scroll. Then wrap it around if needed to simulate an infinite loop. This lets slide cycle seamlessly from the end back to the start without visual breaks. For each slide, we interpolate its horizontal movement to make the sliding smooth and only update its position if it's within a reasonable range. This keeps performance optimized by avoiding unnecessary updates on the slides that are too far off screen. And finally, for each visible slide, we call our distortion function to apply real-time mesh curvature based on how fast the user is interacting. Once all positions and distortions are updated, we render the scene using the 3GS renderer and camera. And that's it. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.